Hi guys, let's do, I'm going to do the first part of this lecture. I'm back in my office now and I forgot to start the uh, the recorder. So I'm just going to go to uh, maybe about five, ten minutes here and then I'll stop once I hit, remember to turn on the recorder. So uh, it is week five, it's Monday. We're going to talk about the uh, the anatomy and some pathology associated with that. Some We'll get to more physiology uh, next time. But we're just starting our discussion of the, the pharynx and the esophagus. Uh, the pharynx is an incredibly complicated structure, as you will see here in a second. So let's go through it. Uh, before we did that, some I had been getting some questions, and I thought you guys knew this already, but there is some confusion about this. I just assume that you know this stuff by second quarter, but... Let's go through some of this directional language, and we'll just do it really fast. Uh, this is the anatomical position, the palms forward. In front means anterior and ventral. Behind means posterior and dorsal. Down toward the floor, inferior or caudal. Toward the head, upwards, that superior cranial cephalad. Rostral really shouldn't be used. That's really when we're talking about the brain, but I have seen... Some texts use the term rostral, meaning superior. Not a great term. If we look at the brain, though, uh, we'll see where rostral really occurs. Uh, if you put a, a cut like this right through the cerebellum, through the frontal cortex here, rostral is toward the frontal cortex, toward the front of the brain. A caudal would be toward the back of the brain. In the anatomical position, you really don't use caudal and rostral. Uh, in a in a front to back manner. Superior is still superior. When you get to the brain stem, then you can use the term caudal in the more traditional type way, that, like you do the rest of your body, but not the brain itself. Caudal is the back of the brain. The brain stem caudal is down toward the floor. Okay, so kind of kind of confusing. Let's talk about cuts here. Uh, so this is our embryology cuts We're using a chicken embryo here. And if you take a cut right down through the crown of the head, the nose, the belly button like that, that's called a mid-sagittal cut. It creates a sagittal plane. The cut is along the sagittal plane. If it's right down the middle, it's mid. If you cut off to the side, the right or left, that's called a parasagittal cut. Paracat sagittal cut. Now, if you're a lumberjack and you saw a tree across like this, that's called an axial cut. A lot of AKAs for this one, that mnemonic is CHAT. Cross-sectional, horizontal, axial, transverse. In radiology, you always use axial. In anatomy, you often use horizontal or cross-sectional. Okay. Um, so another cut is down through the ear, the shoulder, the knee. Uh, that would is a frontal cut or a coronal cut. In radiology, we call that coronal cut. Okay, And then another important concept is how you view these cuts. So if we have an axial cut through the brain here, you don't look at it from the sides to see the cut. To see the actual cut, this green thing is the slice that's been made like a slice of bologna. If you want to see the bologna, you have to get up above or below. So overhead view is the best or from underneath. If you do a cut from this, uh, a coronal cut of the brain, same thing. You have to, you can't see it from the coronal plane. You have to go in front or behind to see this cut. And same with a sagittal cut. You can't stand, if you, if you do a sagittal cut, um, you can't look in the sagittal plane. You have to go and look from the sides to see the sagittal cut, if that makes sense. Right? Now we talked about, uh, we talked about this. Uh, this is a, well, you tell me what that is. That's an axial cut, like a lumberjack cut, through the disc. So that's the disc. There's the nucleus propulsus. And I told the class, I said, what are these things? And no one knew what those were. That's what you're going to be treating mostly for the next 
20, 30 years, maybe more. Those are the facet joints or the Z joints or the zygapotheceal joints. What's this white stuff? This is a T2-weighted MRI. That's uh, cerebral spinal fluid. What are these things? You guys just had that on your uh, spinal 2 test today. That's the cauterquina, right? If this is L4, that's the L5 traversing nerve root. That's the L4 exiting nerve root, right? They rip out. I guess you guys didn't really know how that worked very well. Um, but there it is. There's ligamentum flavum right there, that structure. All right, then we talked about this. Just ignore the stuff in the middle right now. But this is a radiograph. This is a sagittal view. This is a coronal view. And does anybody know what this test is out there, besides the ones we just had the lecture? This is called provocated discography. And this is a patient that's beyond chiropractic care, beyond physical therapy, beyond medication. They have so much pain they can't work. They're going to lose their house. they got to do something. And a lot of times, a rip within the disc uh, can cause horrible pain to the point you need to basically get rid of the disc. And the way to prove or make the diagnosis of discogenic pain, and I should mention that you guys didn't know this. Remember, the back of the disc is filled with nerves, right? And you should know who those nerves are. Those are sinovertebral nerves. My next lecture, since you guys are not getting this, I'm going to have to put that in because you've got to know that. Sinovertebral nerves can carry the sensation of back pain and even referred leg pain. Sometimes the disc rips open and the degenerated nucleus propulsus can put cytokines onto these nerves and spark an inflammation. It can cause horrible debilitating pain. To make that diagnosis, there's a test that you only do in people who are in severe pain. And they've failed all types of treatment. And these are not the patients who have back pain and they, they're upset because they can't play softball or they can't do things. Uh, this test is only for people who, they can't work. I mean, they're going to lose the they're going to lose their house. This is severe pain because they're headed for fusion. And to make the diagnosis of an annular tear that's causing the pain, you can inject a contrast material into the nucleus and see what happens to it. It should stay within the nucleus propulsus. If the disc is ripped toward the back where those nerves are, you can see like this one. It's ripped completely through. And that's a grade 4 annular tear. Here's a grade 5 annular tear, Dallas discogram classifications, where it's leaking. Okay, see how that is? And when they pressurize up, this patient had horrible pain, the same pain that they always had. That makes the diagnosis of discogenic pain. So they would basically remove these discs and fuse these three segments together. That's the inner body fusion. That's what Tiger Woods had. Okay, let's keep going. Though. Okay, I... You guys know this already, proximal and distal the concept. So the further away from the midline of the body, uh, the more distal you are. So the wrist is distal to the elbow. The wrist is distal to the shoulder. The elbow is distal to the shoulder. The shoulder is proximal to the wrist because it's closer to the body. See how that works? Uh, the ASIS in the knee. So the knee is more inferior to the ASIS, anterior and posterior. So the, we could say the nipple is anterior to the scapular, the shoulder blade on the back. All right, you guys know how that works. Then we did a test here. So how can we string all these words together? Well, let's say we have a lung tumor, and it's deep into the plane of the page. How do we know it's deep? Because if it was superficial, it would be super red like this. If it's deep, it's faded away. That's just my little scale right there. It tells you it's deep. And the question is, the carina, which you may or may not know, you might as well know that now, that's the split where the trachea splits into the right and left primary bronchi. Uh, how would you describe that tumor in relation to the carina? Well, let's see. It's superior. It's lateral. And it's deep, so that would be posterior. Or you could use any combination of those words, and you can string them together. 
so it's posterior lateral superior. Could have said it's superior lateral posterior. You can use any combination of those words, and that's how you name things. All right, basic stuff. All right, let's look at this very complicated pharynx now. It's pronounced pharynx or pharynx, tomatoes, tomatoes. It's basically a hollow tube that runs through the center of the neck. It's shaped like a funnel. It's wider up here at the top part. It's more narrow down here. What does it do? It takes food from the mouth and liquid from the mouth, passes it down to the esophagus. Esophagus, which we'll look at next, takes it all the way down to the stomach. Simple as that. If you got water in your nose, that can also connect to the esophagus. If you got food in your nose, it could also connect there. It's not good to get food in your nose, but liquid would drain down into here. That also connects to the stomach through the esophagus. Okay, there's three parts of the pharynx named after the cavities that are in front of them. Here's the nasal cavity, so that must be the nasal pharynx. Here's the oral cavity. The mouth is the oral cavity. This must be the oral pharynx. Here's the larynx, or the voice box right here. So this must be the laryngopharynx. See how that works? So, so far so good. Below this little cartilage right here, this is called the cricoid cartilage, the lamina of the cricoid cartilage. The pharynx ends at the inferior part of the, laryng uh, of the cricoid cartilage here and it becomes the esophagus. Specifically, that's the upper esophageal sphincter, which we'll talk about next time. Okay, so far so good. Now it's gonna get more complicated. So we do have some connections that I can test you on. Let's look at the nasal pharynx first. Well, let's see, well, it's connected to the nasal cavity. Okay, um, we'll look at borders here in a second. Where we, um, I'll also tell you right now, the border between the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx is something called the choana. Choana, a.k.a. posterior nasal aperture. Posterior nares, there's a whole bunch of AKs for this. Best one Gray's Anatomy uses is the choana. Okay, it's right before the eustachian tube here. Uh, torus tubarius is right here. It's a mound of, of lymphoid tissue. It's right just anterior to torus tubarius there. Okay, and if it's not marked, don't worry about torus tubarius, or you'll you'll get that soon. All right. Um, so we have another border here. It borders the oropharynx. Uh, where does that occur? Where's the demarcation zone? Where's the border occur? It's at the it's at the soft palate, and I guess you guys didn't know what the hard palate was even. So the hard palate is the top of the roof of the mouth, and then it forms a soft palate. And then the soft palate goes into the uvula. So soft, the, the end of the soft palate, the posterior inferior part of the soft palate, uh, which is here, I guess there's no uvula. This is a bad drawing. I guess, is that the uvula there? I think that's supposed to be the tonsil. But anyway, we've got a better drawing coming up. But that's the border. Um, that actually has a name. That's called... An isthmus is sometimes used as a border name. This is called the pharyngeal isthmus right here. The pharyngeal isthmus is the border between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. Pharyngeal isthmus. Let's look at the oral pharynx now. Notice that is the nasopharynx have any connection to the oral cavity? No, it doesn't. Let's look at the oral pharynx. Uh, well, it connects to the nasal cavity, we said. It connects to the the ringopharynx, there's no name for that border. There is, there is a structure where this imaginary border occurs. And that's the base of this little flap here called the, UV, or called the uh, epiglottis. That's where that occurs. But there, the oral pharynx is connected, obviously, to the mouth. Um, and so we do have another one of these imaginary lines. We'll look at it more. I have a better picture coming up of it. Uh, but there is an imaginary line right here called the oral pharyngeal isthmus would be right in here in this picture. And that's the border between the oral cavity and the oral pharynx. 
the oral pharyngeal isthmus. Great. And then laryngopharynx is connected with the larynx or the voice box is all of this structure right here. There's no, there's no name for that. Um, it's connected to the oral pharynx at this imaginary line between at the base of the epiglottis. It's also connected to the esophagus at the inferior margin. The author didn't quite show it right. Inferior margin of the lamina of the cricocartilage. Good. I know this is confusing. Play it back and listen to it. Um, here's just another kind of highlighting these new names for you. It's probably a lot of new stuff here. Again, here's the hard palate. Soft palate is the structure right here after the hard palate. This is bone, hard palate, hard palate. And then this is all soft palate. Right at the end of the soft palate where it gives rise to the uvula, that is that magical line called the pharyngeal isthmus. Pharyngeal isthmus separates the nasopharynx from the oral pharynx. Got it? What separates the nasopharynx from the nasal cavity? This imaginary line or structure, it's not imaginary, you can see it. It's called the choana. That's the right choana there. It's the right and the left. Also posterior nasal aperture. Posterior nares is AKs for that. Great. Um, the other one we have, uh, we should look at this tonsil right here. This is the palatine tonsil. Okay, there's two folds of tissue. One in front of the palatine tonsil and one behind it. The palatine tonsil sits between these folds of tissue. The one anterior is called the palatoglossal fold, and we, we can see this better coming up. Uh, the one behind it is called palatopharyngeal fold. So the palatoglossal fold is what's used to make this imaginary demarcation border type line called the oropharyngeal isthmus. Go to the left of the oropharyngeal isthmus, you're in the oral cavity. Go to the right, you're in the oral pharynx. So the palatine tonsil, this is the one that kids that gets really swollen up, they have to take it out. Um, is that in the oral cavity or in the oral pharynx? It's in the oral pharynx. There's also, I might show you these little bumps here. These are all lingual tonsils because they're connected to the tongue. Palatine has nothing to do with lingual. Lingual means tongue. Palatine means palate, close to the palate. So this is a different tonsil, palatine tonsil. These are microscopic. You can't see them very well. They're like little bumps here. But they're in the back of the tongue. Those are called lingual tonsils. All right, great. So we got the oral pharynx done, I think. And we said the oral pharynx connects to the laryngeal, laryngopharynx at the base of the epiglottis. So right about here is the end of the oral pharynx, and then this starts the, the laryngopharynx. Laryngopharynx will connect to the esophagus. Where does this junction occur? At the base of the epiglottis, the oral pharynx becomes the laryngo, or the laryngopharynx becomes the esophagus, or I'm sorry, at the base of the epiglottis, that's the end of the oropharynx. That's the start of the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx ends at the base of the cricoid cartilage. I know, I know it's confusing, but what can I do? This is confusing tissue. You have to listen back to this and get all this stuff in your noodles. Not a great picture. Larynx should be much bigger. Very small space for the larynx there. All right, uh, relationships. This is really hard stuff. I mean, this is a, these are advanced bore type questions, but uh, what's the superior border of the esophagus in general? Specifically, you could say the esophagus in general, or you could say the nasopharynx. What's the superior border? It's another tonsil right here. That's called the pharyngeal tonsil. Pharyngeal tonsil. You probably have heard of a different word for it called the adenoids. The adenoids... It's really got hundreds of microscopic lymphoid tissue that makes it up, but it's really a single structure. There's not a right and a left lymph adenoid. It's a single structure, but it's really called the pharyngeal tonsil, and that makes up a superior uh, border. 
superior relationship to this nasopharynx. If you go into the bone, we have the clivus right here. We'll look at that in a second. There's the sphenoid portion of the clivus. There's the occipital portion, specifically the basilar portion of the clivus is right here, this part right there. We'll look at that more in a second. And that's it. That's superior structure. Um, anterior, what are the anterior boundaries? May, relationship, maybe boundary would have been a better word. What are anterior boundaries uh, to the, we'll start with the nasopharynx. Uh, well, we got the choana, we got the soft palate, we got the uvula, uh, we have the epiglottis. We have the larynx, we have the cricoid cartilage. These are all anterior structures. What about posterior structures? Uh, well, we have, you don't know these muscles yet. We're going to take a look at them. You have the cervical spine, but there's these really thin, flat muscles that live here um, that we will take a look at. They're the longest colli and the longest capitis. Uh, those are the posterior boundaries or posterior relationships. Now let's look at that clivus again. This is, let's look at this picture first. Um, so here's the clivus right here. Here's the cella turcica where the pituitary sits. And it's this, I used to teach it as a ski slope. It's really smooth and it, you ski and ski and ski and then fall into the foramen magna. Really smooth structure. It's made of two parts. It's made of the body of the sphenoid here. It's not the dorsum cellae. That's a different part. It's below the dorsum cellae right here. Uh, and it's this part right here. This is the basilar portion of the occiput. Together they make up a structure called the clivus. Okay. And that's what I tried to make here. I tried to draw in the clivus. Uh, and here's just a better picture. You can see the. that's the basilar portion of the clivus. That's the sphenoid portion of the clivus. Why do we care about that? Because they make up this bony part right here, which is one of the superior boundaries of the nasopharynx. Got it? Okay, here's another shot. Uh, this is a coronal view where the front of the face is actually pulled off and we have a cut right through the esophagus, or I'm sorry, right through the pharynx. Doesn't quite make it to the esophagus. Oh yeah, it does. It's probably esophagus down here. Um, yeah, because there's laryngopharynx. This is esophagus right there. Um, so anyway, we can actually see the holes that communicate with the nasal cavity and the oral cavity here, although the tongue's kind of blocking that. Um, but this this is a P to A view. The eyes would be deep into the plane of the page. And yeah, so let's look at the nasal pharynx. You can see uh, right here. So there's the choana. If you go through these holes into the plane of the page, you're in the nasal cavity. If you breathe air and breathe, air flows right out of the plane of the page, you're passing through the choana, then you're in the nasal cavity, or then, you then you're in the nasal pharynx. Okay, so the nasal pharynx goes from these choana, and it ends at the posterior part, posterior inferior part of the soft palate. This is all soft palate. In a downward position, this changes whether or not you're breathing and eating food. This, we'll talk about that, how that works. Okay, if you get below the soft palate, then you've entered the oral pharynx. Okay, oral pharynx. And the oral pharynx has a connection with the oral cavity through this structure called the oropharyngeal isthmus. Oropharyngeal isthmus. Right? The bottom border of the oropharynx is the base of the epiglottis. There's the epiglottis. Uh, and yeah, the larynx would be right inside this little pouch tube right here. Uh, laryngopharynx would be, yeah, this would be the laryngopharynx. Pharynx would be inside here, or the larynx would be inside here. Laryngopharynx is right here. Laryngopharynx is below the base of the epiglottis. And it goes to the cricoid cartilage, that inferior piece of the lamina of the cricoid cartilage, which is not shown. Okay, are we good? Where's the, where's the, 
Where's the trachea? Trachea would be deep to the structure, into the plane of the page. Okay. All right, there's just a look at that lamina there, uh, or this uh, lamina of the cricoid cartilage. It's like a ring, you put it on your finger. Um, it connects to the, the, tra the laryngeal cartilage right here. That's the lamina of the laryngeal cartilage. Laryngeal prominence, I had everybody grab their Adam's apple in the class. You can feel that bump there. Uh, it connects to this cricoid cartilage. That's where they, you ever see in the movies where someone's choking and they stick a, a pen and they stab it in their throat? It's this a cricothyroid ligament right here is where they stick the pen theoretically. Don't You should never do that, by the way. Unless you're trained in that sort of stuff. But yeah, that's the cricoid cartilage. Very important structure. Why do we care about it? Because the bottom of this right here is the demarcation zone. Below it is the esophagus. Above it is the laryngopharynx. That's why we care about it. And I believe this is where I turned back on the video. So I think I can turn it off at this point. Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. So palatoglossal, palatopharyngeal, folds, a.k.a. arch. Yep, exactly. Good question. They're a.k.a. for arch. Right? And the tonsils, the palatine tonsils sit between them. Also, if we take this palatoglossal fold and we draw imaginary line between it and the other palatoglossal fold, and I just demonstrated my amazing Photoshop skills and colored that in for you, that is the oral, because it goes from the oral cavity to the pharynx behind, that's the oral pharyngeal isthmus. That's the demarcation line between the oral cavity and the pharynx. Good? Good as possible? I think I got everything I wanted to say there. More view. Here's a, uh, an overhead view again. Uh, so here's that palatoglossal fold, and that's exactly where that imaginary line is drawn. And you can see anything forward where the tongue is, that's the oral cavity. Anything behind that line, we're in the pharynx, specifically the oral pharynx, because we're behind that, we're behind that line. So technically, the palatine tonsils, are they in the oral cavity? No, they're behind it. Oral cavity is right here. This is the end of the oral cavity. Once you go across this border, you're in the pharynx, you're specifically the oral pharynx. And the palatine tonsils actually sit in the oral pharynx. They don't sit in the oral cavity. Softball anatomy board question right there. And I'm sure you'll get this again uh, somewhere down the road, but might as well get some of this right now. It's all got to get in the noodle by about sixth quarter when your boards happen. Make sure you have, well, these are pretty good notes, but because are you going to remember this stuff by the time fifth and sixth quarter? No. So, but that's why you have to memorize this stuff and do good on tests. Because once you get it in your deep memory, you'll forget it. But if you have it in your deep memory, and when you go to a board review, it comes back like that. And that's the secret to doing well on boards. No one remembers all this stuff for that long. But it, if you sink it in deep memory, uh, it comes back so much easier. People who don't do well on boards usually don't do well on exams. Uh, and they don't have stuff in deep memory, and then they come to a board review and they're just overwhelmed. They can't remember it, everything. So that's why it's very important. I mean, study you can't really cram for boards. Boards is just refreshing stuff that you already know. That's the object of doing well on boards. All right. Uh, study to palatine tonsils sit between the palatoglossal arches and the palatopharyngeal arches. Yep, that's true. There's the palatopharyngeal arches cut, palatoglossal arches right there. All right, oh, now we're in some familiar territory, I hope, because you have had osteology of the spine. What's number six? Quick, quick, number six. No, 
Haven't heard it yet. Anterior tubercle. Anterior tubercle. What's number five? Posterior tubercle. What's the piece between here? Enter tubercular, because these are tubercles, means in between the tubercles, enter tubercular lamellae. Yeah, so weird transverse process, right? On In the typical cervicals, they're double strutted or double barred transverse processes on all the normal cervical vertebrae. And at the end of those bars, you have these tubercles, some of which are really big. What's the biggest anterior tubercle? In the cervical spine. It's even got a name. It's called the carotid tubercle. What is it? Where is it? C6. You have carotid tubercles. You can palpate them even if you, as long as you're not sensitive and don't pass out, you can go right medial to your SCM, right down by your cricoid cartilage and push. I can feel mine really easy. Nice big bump right there. Those are your C6 uh, carotid tubercles. Uh, let's see. What's this called? Number one. Spinous process. What's weird about it? Bifid. What's number two? Lamina. What's number nine? That trips people up. That's the pedicle. Pedicle. What's number eight? Transverse foramen. What goes through there? Or T, what part, if this is C4, what part of the vertebral artery? V1, 2, 3, 4. You should know V1, 2, 3, 4. Somebody in the news, somebody just had a stroke, right? Dr. James just showed me somebody just got stroked. I think they died from a chiropractic adjustment. It's in the news right now. Yep. V2, that part of the vertebral artery has a double 100 degree bend and it usually builds up a little plaque. And one in 10 million people, you do an adjustment, it breaks loose the plaque and it goes up, gets stuck in the brain and you have a stroke and yep, just a freak, freak thing. But it does happen. And boy, does it make the news when it happens. Uh, how about number three? These would be sloping backwards a little more than this. They're not really flat. These are articular surfaces of the superior facets or you could call them facets of the superior articular processes. I think that's it. What's that number 11? Vertebral foramen, which is part of the vertebral canal. So make sure I do, I taught spinal anatomy for a long time. I like my spinal anatomy. Any chance I have to bring it back to life, I will get you with it. So make sure you know that stuff if you don't already. There's a case I had over the week, very interesting case. You guys like case studies? Kind of keeps keeps everybody awake. Very interesting. So 62-year-old male consulted with me uh, over the weekend. Horrible neck pain, uh, can't work, can't sleep, just miserable. They want to do fusion on him. Well, has anybody, what's the first thing you see, which is weird? Yeah, this is a pro disc. This is an artificial disc. Uh, so he's had two pro discs put in instead of the standard ACDF. There's something that you guys probably should be going, whoa, maybe you're not yet. Maybe it's too early for you, but I'm going to plant this in your brains right now. Does this help? He has rheumatoid arthritis. He's had it for many years. Rheumatoid, ar rheumatoid arthritis loves the cervical spine. It's an autoimmune anti-inflammatory or inflammatory disease where the body attacks the ligaments of the cervical spine. Not in everybody, but in some people, yes. Do you remember this ligament? The cruciform ligament, right? This is a critical ligament to stabilizing atlas and axis. When you adjust somebody, the reason, and you push on atlas, the reason it doesn't slip out and paralyze them is because mainly this cruciform ligament. There's some accessory ligaments, all our ligaments as well, but this is really important. And how do you, I mean, we can't see the patient. We don't have x-ray glasses. How do we know if the cruciform ligament is intact? Yep, somebody said gap. 
You see that? You know what that gap is called? No. The, the ADI space. You write, I guarantee you I'm going to test you on that. I guarantee that's going to be on boards. Anterior dens interval. Anterior dens interval. Oh, I'm sorry. Atlanto dens interval. Atlanto means atlas. Dens is the dens, this little peg right here. This is the ADI space. It should never, ever, ever be greater than three millimeters. If it is greater than three millimeters and you do an upper cervical adjustment, you can kill the patient. So you have to be very careful. Anybody who's in a whiplash type accident and you adjust them without having x-rays, you're crazy because you just don't know if one of these is here. If you adjust people and you don't take a good history, you don't take their clothes off, you don't do an exam, you adjust them, crazy. And your license is so expensive, you gotta be so careful with it these days. So you would never adjust this patient, you could kill them. Uh, their problem was rheumatoid arthritis. Their cruciform ligament is pulp, it's destroyed, and this is sliding forward. I did a, uh, we did a flexion extension study where we bent his head forward I didn't put that in there, so we're getting too far into the weeds. This bone slid out about five millimeters, and this bone slid out about four millimeters. They're completely unstable. He doesn't want to have another fusion to extend this up, uh, but he's already getting signs of myelopathy. He's getting numbness in his fingers and hands. He can't write. He's wobbling when he walks. He's getting signs of myelopathy. He's got to have the fusion. If he got in another rear an accident with this instability like this, it could kill him really easily. So I'm very conservative with recommending surgery. I had a failed surgery, so my back is sore right today. It just never was right after that, but some people need it. And this is a case where he's going to need it. Um, but yeah, um, this is kind of cool too. This is the whole point. We're getting to the whole point. This does tie in with our lecture too. Um, this, is a, this is a CT scan. A CT scan is thousands of slices in different planes, and the computer can take those slices and put them back together to create um, a three-dimensional image. So this is a 3D CT scan, and on my disc, I can spin it around, you can spin it upside down, and you can look at it from all different directions. But the whole point of the lecture for you guys, what are these big bumps? Can you see the trough right here? There's where the spinal nerve comes out. Posterior tubercle, anterior tubercle. These are the anterior tubercles. Why do I care about the anterior tubercles? Do you know some muscles attached to those anterior tubercles? Maybe you don't yet because you haven't had. I guess that'll be next quarter. Uh, but the longissimus colli, the longus, longus uh, muscles, colli and capitus, both attach to these. Uh, the scaling muscles, have you had those yet? Scalings attach into these as well. So these tubercles are very important for muscle attachments here. But this really kind of drives the point how prominent these things are uh, on the cervical spine. So those are the anterior tubercles. And there's everything I just said. I measured the ADI space, 3.3. Uh, it's over 3. You should never adjust this patient. Uh, this, You should never see this. How can you tell this is a inflammatory attack. Can you see anything else strange about this? The body is, the body thinks his ligaments and are foreign for whatever reason. It gets confused and it attacks them like it would a virus. How's that look? Shouldn't that be really smooth? So this is how smooth this is here. There's the cortex of the bone. See how it's all chopped up like that? Uh, that's, you see that it's either an infection or it's really bad arthritis. And in this case, it's part of the inflammatory disease that's ripping that up. Okay, so no adjustment. How about, what else can we see on him? Oops. How's that cervical curve? Have you talked about cervical curves yet? It's supposed to be what? Kyphotic or lordotic? Lordotic. So there's the dens. It's supposed to be C-shaped like that. Is that C-shaped curve? No, he's, that's hypolordotic. It, you can hallucinate it, maybe even being a little kyphotic there. Um, is that a good thing? No. It completely messes up the biomechanics of these joints. Premature arthritis will stop. That's why when you get 
car accident patients and they get whiplash and they're a hundred percent better and they're all happy and you see their x-ray was like this, never release them as pre-injury. Insurance companies will love you if you say patient released pre-injury status. That means they're off the hook forever for the, any medical treatment because in 10, 15 years, I guarantee you the person would have some kind of neck pain. It takes a long time to wear out the joints, but the biomechanics are messed up. So you always want to put the prognosis as guarded because they lost their normal cervical curve. Uh, and that way, uh, if 10 years, 15 years down the road, they start having all kinds of neck problems, insurance will have to pay again. Either that or they'll pay them off. The settlement will be bigger because they'll pay them for future medical just to be done with them. But pre-injury means they're, they're as good as new and they're not. If you lost your cervical curve, you're not as good as new. Any questions about this stuff? Be good as good as possible. All right. Oh yeah. This also relates to our lecture day. What's this thing right here? That's the epiglottis. And what do you know anything about x-ray? Why is this black? Do you know how x-rays are made? Where they shoot photons at you? Like if this is the x-ray tube, I'm gonna take a picture x-ray of me. Okay, here's the, there's some kind of photosensitive film. We used to use like cassette film back in the day. So I would stand like this and there's a machine that comes down and it shoots photons at me. And the photons are so powerful, they go right through me and they hit the film back here. Uh, and the more photons that hit the film, the whiter the film is. Like where my teeth are, are the photons going to get through my teeth? Uh-uh. So where my teeth are will be black. Or, uh, let's see, do I have that backwards? So backwards. So if all the photons get through and hit the film, it turns them black, it exposes the film. Right? So my teeth would be white. This, and what is this called, by the way? You should know that. Somebody mumbled it, I think. Anterior tubercle. Anterior tubercle of atlas. Um, it's a very strong structure. It's got a lot of ligaments and muscles attaching, so it's very white. A lot of photons didn't make it through on this. The CT is just kind of an x-ray, many, many different x-rays taken. This is air. So when you shoot photons at a structure with air in it, they actually speed up and get more power, and they can penetrate even better. So you can always tell gas and air because the film behind will be completely exposed. So this is, if this is air, what do you think this is right here? If this is the epiglottis, that's going to come down and close this. This is the oral pharynx. Very good. This is the oral pharynx. And then this would be, it's not the, what comes before the trachea. The air passes before, goes to the trachea, passes through something. It's allowing me to talk right now. Larynx. So this would be the larynx. Trachea is probably just starting right about here. So you can see a lot of stuff on x-ray. Laryngeal pharynx would be back here and it's closed off because you don't want, we'll talk about the upper esophageal sphincter next time. It's always closed so you don't get, normally you don't get air going in. Very good question. The laryngeal pharynx would be right here, but it's shut down. Oh, actually, sorry. That would be back here, but it's shut down. It would be down in here. Okay. So you guys could handle that if I threw that on the test. Oral pharynx, larynx, epiglottis, hopefully the ADI space. I will. I, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to put ADI space on it. And you're going to know it should never, ever, ever be greater than how many millimeters? Three millimeters. Never adjust someone. Ever. Um, you should know the cruciform ligament. That should be review for you. Right? Why is it called cruciform? Cross-like. And remember, it has several pieces. What's this major piece called right here? Transverse ligament of atlas is the main one. That holds atlas and axis together, upper fibers, lower fibers. You have alar ligaments right here. 
they connect to the dens. We're not going to go crazy into these, but all right. What else we got here? No, longest collie. I think you'll get this next quarter, but let's at least look at it because it's it's the anterior. Uh, it's part of the posterior border of the pharynx. So let's look at it. So there's two of them. There's a longus capitis, which is always more lateral, and it's always shorter. There's a longus colli, which is more medial, and that one goes all the way down to T3. I always think collies can run a lot further than you could throw a baseball cap. Collies can run a long ways, and this one runs all the way down. Probably won't go crazy in this, but the longissimus collie, it's a complicated muscle. There's three parts that have their own origins and insertions, and I don't think we need to get into that. Um, you should know what runs between atlas and T3, and what, it is, what does it arise from, or what's the origin of this thing? Well, anterior vertebral bodies, as well as the star of the show here, the anterior tubercles uh, and the transverse processes. So it go, extends to the actual struts of the transverse processes as well as the anterior tubercles. And it inserts into anterior tubercles as well, as well as the bodies. The key take-home note card point of the longus colli, it does not connect to the skull. So it has no action on the skull. It can't rock or nod the skull up and down. That's not true of longus capitis. Capitis means cap. That means it attaches to the skull. So Longus capitis can flex the skull, but longus colli can flex the cervical spine, but not the skull. Question. Longissimus cervices on the backside? Yeah, these are front muscles. Yeah, we're on the front. But they're kind of cousins in a way to the back muscle. These are eyes to to help you. I don't know if they help you or not. I forgot to show you the eyes. This is an A to P view of the cervical spine. Good question, though. Um, they're innervated by anterior ventral rami, C2 through C6. What else? Ventral rami, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? C5, C6, that makes up, well, I think it was drawn right up here on the board. What are the ventral rami of C5 and 6? 7, 8, eight and one also make this structure up. It's right in here. Brachial plexus, those are the roots. Rick Taylor drinks coarse beer, you know that one? For the roots, tr cords, trunks. Yeah, the roots are really nothing but the anterior rami or the ventral rami. Okay, what's its action? It flexes the cervical spine. It doesn't do anything to the head though. Okay, does not reach the occiput. So I'm, for me, for our test, I'm not going to say, give me the exact insertions. You don't have to memorize that for me. But I do want you to know it doesn't flex the head. It flexes the cervical spine. You should know it goes from atlas to T3. That's probably good enough for us. If they want to go deeper into that next quarter, that's fine. But for me, that's good enough. Now, the longus capitis is wider. It's more lateral, but it doesn't extend uh, as far. Um, it also arises from anterior tubercles as well. The key with this one, though, it actually inserts into the basal portion of the occiput. Um, so that's important. Because it inserts into the occiput, it's able to rock the skull forward. So that so it doesn't, do, it probably helps with, it helps a little with cervical flexion as well. But the key with this one, it flexes the skull. And the other one doesn't. Longus colli doesn't do that. Okay? So study tip, longus capitis bridges the cervical spine and occiput. Longus colli doesn't. Therefore, longus capitis affects the head, but longus colli doesn't. So watch out for those study tips. Okay, esophagus. Let's go to the esophagus. How are we on time? Do we need a break? Break? Okay, let's do a break. All right, here we go. So now we've made it down to the esophagus. What is the esophagus? Well, it's a neuromuscular tube. It's got a lot of nerves and wires in it. 
it's because it's got to do peristalsis, uh, but it's muscular. We'll look at the histology of it next time. Uh, but it borders, where does it come from? It connects to the laryngopharynx. Laryngopharynx. Does it connect to the trachea? Not normally, no. Connects to the pharynx, specifically the laryngopharynx. And then it connects the other end, it connects down to the stomach, specifically the cardiac portion of the stomach, which we'll look at the parts of the stomach pretty probably next week. Um, you could also say it starts at the level of C6 and extends all the way down to T11. So it's a pretty long structure. It almost goes all the way through the, all the thoracic vertebrae except for T12. So pretty long structure. Um, just again, specifically where it starts, here's that cricoid cartilage I showed you. Here's the lamina of the cricoid cartilage. There's the arch of the cricoid cartilage. That's where it starts. The inferior part of the cricoid cartilage is right where the esophagus starts. You should definitely know where it starts. And what it connects to, connects to laryngopharynx. Okay, esophagus is made of three parts. We're not going to go, they're not nearly as complicated as the pharynx, though. There's a cervical esophagus, so the esophagus lives in the cervical spine. A little left of the midline. It's posterior to the larynx and the trachea. Uh, there's a thoracic esophagus, and there's an abdominal esophagus. Clinically, this is the big one right here. We're going to spend some time talking about this little stubby abdominal esophagus. Who's heard of GERD before? GERD. That's GERD. Yeah. It's all about this region, the, esoph the abdominal esophagus. We'll look at it today a little bit. Very common problem. Okay, there's the three parts. So cervical esophagus is behind the trachea. There's the thoracic esophagus hidden by the trachea as well. And then there's the abdominal esophagus. So we had to penetrate. What's that structure called that helps that, that you breathe with? What's that muscle? The diaphragm. So it pierces the diaphragm and then it becomes no longer a thoracic organ. It becomes an abdominal organ. And that's got all sorts of clinical stuff to it. Uh, we should review the mediastinum. I kind of made these slides thinking you had already had uh, anatomy. But nevertheless, you've got to learn it anywhere or anyway. So here it is. You, do you know what the mediastinum is? You ever heard of that word? Mediastinum is your thorax. Your thorax is your chest cavity. It's your thorax. And the mediastinum is is a bunch of ca visible category or visible partitions that partition your your thoracic cavity up and we'll look at those here in a second do you remember the divisions of the mediastinum no because you never had them but here they are so here's a lateral view of the thorax your chest here's your heart and here's the divisions this is your mediastinum so the medium stinum starts up here where the thoracic cavity starts, that's called the thoracic inlet. Who's heard of thoracic outlet syndrome? Yeah, a lot of people. You know the strangest thing about that? It's not the thoracic outlet up here. It's the thoracic inlet. So when they first coined the term thoracic outlet, they completely ignored the anatomy and they misnamed it. And they tried and tried and tried for years to change it to thoracic inlet syndrome. It's too late. It's, it's hooked on, but it's really incorrect. Thoracic inlet is actually down here. That's underneath your rib cage here. That's your thoracic, uh, thoracic outlet is down here. Thoracic inlet is up here. So thoracic inlet syndrome is really bad. The clinicians should have talked with the anatomist before they started naming stuff. And I'm sure someone will point that out further on down the road. But anyway, the upper superior border of the mediastinum is the thoracic inlet. The inferior border is the thoracic outlet or the diaphragm, really. Thora diaphragm, uh, well, they can raise above the thoracic outlet, though. So thoracic outlet is the inferior border. And it's, there's two main divisions of this uh, imaginary partition system. There's the superior mediastinum. Uh, if you 
stick a, I don't think I put this up here, but if you stick a spike right through your second rib, you guys know where the external angle of Louis is? If you do a peace sign, you know, don't know this, so do a peace sign and put it right at that little notch at your top of your sternum. And now roll this finger down. You feel a bump there? Some people feel that's the sternal angle of Louis. That's where the manubrium and the body of the sternum meet. Who cares about that? Slide your finger off laterally and now roll it. You'll feel a rib right there. That's your second rib. That's how you find your second rib. But if you put a spike right through the sternal angle of Louis, that's where this dividing line goes. It goes into a, a T4 vertebrae as well. But so bottom line is there's a superior mediastinum that is above that sternal angle of Louis line. And then there's an inferior mediastinum that's broken up into three separate categories. There's an anterior part, or just often it's just called the anterior mediastinum, but it's really the anterior portion of the inferior mediastinum. There's a middle mediastinum is easy. The heart is the medial mediastinum. And then back to the heart, in back of the heart, that's where the esophagus lives. Uh, that's in the posterior part of the inferior mediastinum. So the esophagus actually goes through the superior and the inferior mediastinum. Specifically, it goes through the back side, the posterior part of both of those mediastinums. And then it does poke a hole through the diaphragm, and it does hang into the abdominal cavity a little bit. And that's going to be a problem, as we'll see. Here's another great guaranteed board question. Guaranteed my question. <coughs> Excuse me. Some fun facts about the esophagus, some oddities. It's really strange. It has a wall, of course, all the way down. The wall is made of muscle, but it's really strange the way it's made. The upper third of it is made of pure skeletal muscle. You can't control it, though. This is a skeletal muscle that is, has no voluntary control. When you go down to the middle third, it's a mixture of smooth muscle and skeletal muscle all mixed together. Really weird. And when you go down to the distal one-third, it's pure smooth muscle. So very strange design. But that's a really common. I should put like 20 stars in the slide. Make sure you know that. Okay, more fun facts. Yeah, you know, we just said that. Strange mix of muscles. Is there two slides? Oh. Um, some more fun facts. Um, the bigger you are, the bigger your esophagus is? No. Some little tiny people, little short people, five feet tall, uh, can have huge long esophaguses. Some guys seven feet tall can have short long esophaguses. So there's no relationship between the height of the human that, that owns it, which is strange. It's also in fairly close proximity to the left ventricle. I'm sorry, the left atrium of the heart. Yeah, these are the fun facts. We looked at that already. All right, meet the, so those of you interested in GERD, this is all about GERD. Meet the lower esophageal sphincter. So here's the diaphragm. So let's back up and kind of zoom out since you haven't had this before. So here's the diaphragm. So thoracic cavity is all here. There's your neck. So below the thoracic cavity is the abdominal cavity. The, the diaphragm, when you breathe, it contracts. When you breathe in, it contracts downward. When you breathe out, you relax the diaphragm, recoils, and pushes the air out. So that's the bottom of the thoracic cavity. And we do have, again, esophagus inside the abdominal cavity. Right inside this hole, and it's got a name. This is the esophageal hiatus. I definitely want you to know that, esophageal hiatus. A hiatus is an opening in something. But right inside the esophageal hiatus, there is a thickening of the esophageal wall. It gets very thick. And that's called the lower esophageal sphincter, this thickening. So let's look at that thickening now. So here it is. Here's the diaphragm coming around. And here's the thickening of the esophageal wall right at the diaphragm level. This is the lower esophageal sphincter, the infamous, 
Those of you who have GERD like I do, battle GERD, it's infamous because it can be, GERD can be a real big problem. I just watched that Survivor, what is that Survivor where they go out in the woods and they try to survive hunting and fishing? I think it's called, is it Survivor? It's got something like that. Alone, there you go, alone. And we're getting down where the couples were out there, we're down to the last two, I won't spoiler alert it, but the last two of them, one of the pairs of each of them had horrible GERD and they're rolling around on the floor. All the stress caused an over-release of acid and they're sleeping flat down and they're both got ulcers and just suffering with GERD. Uh, so why do they have GERD? Because of this thing right here. So normally in young people, this is pretty thick and tough. And normally, it's not like this picture is shown. It's pinched tightly together, which is a good thing because what kind of juice is floating around in your stomach? Acid, right? The stomach has a mucus coating around it so the acid doesn't hurt it. The esophagus doesn't. And as long as this thing is pinched off, you're not going to get acid up into your esophagus. That's what GERD is. When acid bur bubbles up, or burps up into the esophagus, lower esophagus, and starts to damage the esophageal wall, and it causes really bad pain. Kind of an interesting note. Um, in, when, when we get into the cadavers and look for this, we can never really find it. I always had students ask me this. Where's the lower esophageal sphincter? Oh, well, it should be right here, but it's like, where is it, though? You can never find it. And, and research has now did a huge study on this. And it's not there in people who are deceased. And they think it's really not that this is a big, thick muscle. It's, all, it's an area that is spastic because of sympathetic tone. Uh, sympathetic fibers have come into the muscles here and made them just contract like crazy. And so it's more of a, a nervous, uh, a neural stimulation type phenomenon. That's not in the board books yet. For your purposes, it's like this picture says. But in reality, when you get to the cadavers next quarter or the quarter after and look for it, it's not very impressive. It's not, it's just, you can't really tell where it is. You can only tell where it is because it goes in between the, the diaphragm here. So that's a fun fact. Um, in anatomy, it's got some AKAs. You'll probably learn it as the cardiac sphincter. In clinical pathology, they never call it that. It's always the lower esophageal sphincter. Gray's, uh, students Gray's calls it the lower esophageal sphincter, aka cardiac sphincter. There's some other weird ones. They won't be on there. Um, but by itself, it's not very powerful. Therefore, here's the board question. Is it a true anatomical sphincter? You have to be really powerful. Like in the bottom of your stomach, you have a sphincter, a valve that pinches shut and doesn't let the stomach contents out of your stomach until they're digested. That's called the pyloric sphincter. Super powerful, thick. We can see it in anatomy. That's a sphincter. This one is not strong enough to be a real sphincter. So it is not a physiological sphincter. Pyloric sphincter, yes. Lower esophageal sphincter, aka cardiac sphincter, no. Not a physiological sphincter. In order for it to work, it needs some help, as we will see. Um, it's normally uh, located at the level of the esophageal hiatus, as I said already, which is right where the diaphragm is. It's usually about three or four centimeters long. It's normally contracted to the point where your esophagus is pinched shut. What does it do? It prevents gastric acid from coming out of the stomach and burning holes in your esophagus. It also, of course, what else does it do? It allows food to pass from the esophagus into the stomach. Um, you'll learn when you get in pathology about like the nutcracker esophagus and achalasia, there's four esophageal disorders where it doesn't work. It's always pinched shut. And when you swallow, the food can't get through it, and then you start having trouble swallowing. So it's important that it relaxes to allow food to move from the esophagus into the stomach. The little balls of food that pass through your esophagus, those are called boluses. Boluses are little balls of food or balls of liquid. So it's got to relax, and we'll look at the mechanism of that very soon, how that works. So then how does it work? It does need some helpers, as I said. Um, this is also, this would be a Reg 3 anatomy, you'll see this. But really weird, there's, there's these 
wires that connect to the diaphragm, they connect it to the spine to give the diaphragm something to contract against. There's a left and a right crura, just like the crura in your knee. You might have learned those already. The anterior cruciate ligaments can be called crura. But the weird thing about this esophagus, only the right crust circles the esophagus right where it penetrates the diaphragm and it gives it some support and beefs up. And this pinches the esophagus as well. So it's very important that you have a normal, strong crura. Not the left one, but just the right one. Why doesn't the left one do it? Who knows why? It's just another mystery. Uh, but young, you young people, a lot of times you have very strong muscle here. Uh, usually don't have problems with GERD. Some people do. As you get older, muscles and ligaments wither away and dry out. Uh, and this crew may not be as strong as someone my age, and therefore your sphincter is not going to work very good. It's going to be leaky. The muscular portion of the diaphragm itself uh, is also important. That also imparts a closing force uh, of the hiatus itself. So where it pierces the diaphragm, that's a muscular portion of the diaphragm. That pinches it, and this right crust pinches it. And then the muscle inside pinches it. So with those three things, oh, that's a good test question, isn't it? There's three things there. With those three things, you'll have a normally functioning lower esophageal sphincter. You're probably not going to have much trouble with GERD. And everything we said, they're normally, all these are tightly closed, except when a bolus of food is coming at it, they have to relax. But if you get an unnatural relaxation of any of those structures, you're going to get the symptoms of GERD, which is heartburn. We probably all had that a burning pain, right? Usually right over the sternum, uh, just a burning, nasty pain. Some people are shaking their head. Lucky you guys. Hopefully, you'll never find it. I never had it till I got like about 45, and then I started getting it. Uh, but it's it's no fun. Uh, but that's uh, heartburn is is a sign that you have GERD. GERD is gastroreflexophageal disease. Normally, once in a while, and you'll learn, I have YouTube videos on this stuff, but there's some triggers for GERD. Those GERD people know what those triggers are. Spicy, like Mexican or Thai food will set it off. Uh, alcohol relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter. That sets it off. If you mix those two, uh, and if you really like pig out, have like a huge giant burrito, stuff yourself, um, and then go lay down, you'll have GERD for sure. Uh, but if that, if that sphincter system fails, the esophagus is going to get bailed, bathed with acid and you're going to start getting symptoms. No big deal if it happens once in a while. If it's happening every day, like some people battle it every day, it can change. The, the tissue of the esophagus, just like smokers, how the tracheobronchial tree tissue, it changes to a squamous tissue because the smoke is always inflaming it. It, it changes into a tougher tissue that can handle the smoke. Same thing happens here. Um, it actually morphs into a, a stratified squamous type tissue. But the trouble with that tissue, it likes to morph into cancer. So people with chronic GERD, they have to watch out for a precancerous condition called Barrett's esophagus. I want you to know that. Or might as well know that word right now. You're going to have patients bring pathology reports into you. Doctor said I have a Barrett's esophagus. What does that mean? That's that's big trouble. That's a precancerous condition. That can morph into esophageal carcinoma with treatment and chemotherapy. The success, the five-year survival rate is is about fifteen percent for esophageal carcinoma. It's just as bad as pancreatic cancer. It's a nasty cancer. Can be prevented if you if you get your GERD checked and get it under control. Question. That's the $64,000 question. That's like a whole lecture question. But that's one step. you got to avoid those foods that are going to irritate it. Um, and it's not the spicy foods. In the, it's the acid, the pepsin coming up and causing an inflammation. You have to stop that. Um, you have to learn to eat. Um, if I have a big, if I'm going to pig out and really eat a lot, which I like to do, it's going to be at 3 in the afternoon. And I go to bed 9 or 10 o'clock at night. If I eat a big meal at 5 o'clock, the only way I can prevent it, I have to sleep in a recliner. Uh, 
and the gravity will act as my sphincter and keep the acid. It works great that way. I had GERD for five years. I've, I went to Stanford. I had endoscopic evaluations. They wanted to put this little robot uh, lower esophageal sphincter in me. And I'm like, well, is, what can I do? Oh, you just watch your diet. That's all they ever told me. Uh, the guy retired who taught GIGU, and I took over the class, no slides. I had to rebuild it, and I learned about GERD, and I learned about these simple things. Just sleep in a recliner. Use gr Let gravity help you keep, keep the food in your stomach, and don't eat a huge meal, and watch out for those risk factors. I do great. I was on proton pump inhibitors for three or four years, and once you get on those things, it's almost impossible to get off, and knock on wood, I haven't been on those for a long time. Uh, just by watching what I eat. Uh, another rule, uh, right, let everybody say this one, right is wrong. Right is wrong. Never sleep on your right side when you go to bed. If you have heartburn, if you sleep on your right side, especially after you've eaten, the fundus of your stomach won't stop the food from coming up. Uh, the, uh, if you sleep on your left side, the food will be on the left side of your stomach. It'll bang into the esophagus or it'll bang into the fundus. It doesn't have a direct shot to the abdominal esophagus. You sleep on your right side, it's a direct shot. The right, the right esophagus or might as well be part of your stomach. So you're doomed if you sleep on your right side with GERD. Um, that's a really simple fix. So uh, you, if you're symptomatic with GERD and you're really flared up, it can take months for lesions of the stomach. Sometimes they're not even seen on endoscopy. You just get red spots. It can take months for them to heal. So you have to be patient. You probably have to go on PPIs, which are proton pump inhibitors, to turn off the acid, to let the stomach heal. And once it heals, and you're using all these techniques, then you can wean off the PPIs. Uh, that's usually the, that's the way that I did it. So, yeah, I got a huge, like an hour and a half video on GERD on my YouTube channel if you're interested in it. But those are the big things. Watch what you eat. Don't eat before you go to bed and don't sleep on your right side. Uh, and that will help your GERD. Okay. Yep. So watch out for Barrett's esophagus. It's, it's a precancerous condition. Um, let's see. How do we keep this cardiac orifice closed? The hole where the, you have the distal esophagus where it dumps into the stomach. There's a hole there. That's called the cardiac orifice is that hole. But how do you keep that closed? We need three healthy tissues again. We need a healthy uh, esophageal hiatus. We need a, ha a healthy and strong lower esophageal sphincter. And we need a healthy and strong right crust. I can see the question coming. Together, uh, that'll keep your esophagus closed. You're not going to have much trouble with GERD. What does it look like? What does this lower esophageal sphincter look like? You know what endoscopy is? If you, if you stick a tube down your throat with a little camera and you're looking around, let's take a look and see what it looks like. So here is the lower esophageal sphincter in its normal state. And it's pinched. It's not like the picture shows. You can always tell when you're down to the lower esophageal sphincter because there's these little puckers. Those are called the gastric folds. And you've probably heard of the Z-line in histology, I bet. Does that sound familiar, the Z-line? The Z-line never looks like a Z, ever. This is the Z-line. And that's the meeting of the two tissues. This is stomach tissue. This is columnar meeting with stratified squamous here creates this Z-line. People with GERD, this line can be way up higher uh, because of a metamorphosis of the tissue. And you get, it looks like this tissue, but it's not. It's actually intestinal, become intestinalized, it's called. Um, that, that's a sign of a Barrett's esophagus when this Z-line moves way above the, uh, these puckers, way above the lower esophageal sphincter. I won't test you on that, though. I'm getting too much into pathology. I love pathology. Um, so here's some more puckers. We can tell we're at the lower esophageal sphincter. We're inside the esophagus. And the Z-line looks good. It's right at the level of the puckers, so this patient doesn't have a Barrett's esophagus. I, don't, I didn't put a Barrett's in here because I'm getting too much pathology. Um, it's important to know what holds the lower esophageal sphincter in place. And why doesn't the esophagus, it's just a, 
a tube? Why doesn't it just pull up? Why does it, what anchors it to the diaphragm? And there's these things right here. So here is lower esophageal sphincter. Here's the diaphragm. And you got these little cables. Those are called the frenal esophageal ligaments. So these superior frenal esophageal ligaments are very, very important. Heard of a hiatal hernia before? A lot of people. Hiatal hernia means these ligaments are no more. You've ripped these ligaments or they're so degenerated they don't work. And your esophagus gets pulled right up inside your, your thoracic cavity. It may take the stomach right with it. Actually, we'll look at a couple of those here in a second. So those, soft, those frontal esophageal ligaments are really, really important uh, for preventing hiatal hernia. People with hiatal hernias, they, always ha they almost always have GERD as well. We'll look at that here in a second. So frontal esophageal ligaments, really, really important structures. They tether the abdominal esophagus to the diaphragm so it doesn't go out of place. Okay, there it is again, the abdominal esophagus. We talked about it already. Super clinically important, about three centimeters long. Pretty stubby, but it's really clinically important. Anybody, can anybody see a potential problem with this? Now, you probably don't know the answer to this because you, you haven't studied the abdomen yet. But there's, there's a cavity that lines the abdomen. And this cavity, it's called the, the pleural, or it's called the... Uh, peritoneal cavity or peritoneal cavity, tomatoes, tomatoes. I'm a peritoneal type. I went to a med medical school that was British, so they use peritoneal, and I can't get it out of my brain. It just rolls off the tongue better, but it's, it's peritoneal cavity. But I, when I say peritoneal, peritoneal. But there's a cavity that surrounds your abdomen, and all the intestines sit inside it, and this cavity secretes a juice to keep the organs, intestines sliding, slipping over each other. Um, so this is an interperitoneal setup. This, is, this part of the esophagus is actually inside the peritoneal cavity, just like the stomach is. Have you, who's heard of peritonitis? Oh, Uncle Frank got peritonitis. He's in big trouble. He's in the hospital. Very dangerous condition where you get a, usually a bacterial infection that forms inside this cavity somewhere. This cavity is lined with capillaries and the bacteria, if they start growing in here, they can jump into the bloodstream in a second, within hours sometimes. Who's heard of sepsis and septicemia? That's, I mean, 30% of people die from that in the hospital. Very dangerous condition. So if you get a puncture of this abdominal esophagus from GERD, it burns a hole in your esophagus, and now you have dirty food coming from your mouth, which is filthy, right? It hasn't got into the stomach where the acid kills all the bacteria. It dumps right into the peritoneal cavity. It's really easy to get peritonitis, uh, and you could potentially die from a perforation uh, from a, a simple GERD-type problem here. So it is, uh, it is a problem. Okay, there's my amazing... Photoshop skills displayed once again. There's a hole in the abdominal esophagus, and there's some green pussy stuff bacteria have got out here. When bacteria cause an infection, you had micro yet? Uh, they make a nasty, pussy, smelly type of inflammation. Uh, and this is not trouble. This is really close to septicemia. 30% mortality rate for people who get to the hospital. Probably over 90% mortality rate for people who get septicemia and don't go to the hospital. It's the number one killer of older adults in the hospital is septicemia. Oh, let's look at the peritoneal cavity a little bit. So there are three cavities. You probably learned these in histology, but oh, three, there's that magic three. Is that gonna be on the test? That's probably gonna be on the test. Really easy for me to make a question. There's three cavities, they're all set up the same. We just talked about this the abdominal cavity being lined with this blue peritoneum. But there's other cavities that we'll learn about. Uh, there's a pericardial cavity, a sac around your heart. There's a sac around your lungs called the pleural cavity. And then there's the peritoneal cavity. 
They all are serous, uh, they're all mesothelial lined tissues. Uh, that's a form of simple squamous. It's a single layer of cells. But unlike most simple squamous, squamous cells, these secrete a slippery, uh, slippery juice. And all three of these cavities do that. The sac around the heart is slippery. Sac around the lungs is slippery. Sac around the abdomen is slippery as well. All three have two layers that you should know. The parent is the one on the outside. That's called the parietal peritoneum or peritoneum. You'll see that in Ridge 3 as well. I don't think he actually pinned it though, but I'll, I'll show you there if I have you. It's a shiny slippery, even with your gloves, even the cadavers, it's still slippery and shiny. And then this outer parietal layer it takes these big dives inward and it surrounds organs like the intestines. And so this is called visceral pleura. Visceral pleura surrounds all the small intestines and that, that anchors the intestines through something called a mesentery. Mesentery is nothing more but visceral peritoneum that is, that is anchoring. It's come down, it's been born from the parent. The parent gives rise to the viscera. We'll see that theme in, when we get in embryology again about these two types of layers. But anyway, that's a, a look at this uh, peritoneal cavity. There's one weird spot on the liver that's not covered. It's called the bare spot of the liver. We'll see that in reach three as well. If it's not on the slide, you don't have to worry about it. So definitely know the three P's, especially this peritoneal cavity. Who cares? Why am I telling you? Well, there must be some, if I'm telling you about it, there's going to be some pathology behind it. Remember I said that, that membrane secretes a little bit of fluid. If you get an inflammation in there, it can start secreting crazy, ridiculous amounts of inflammation to the point, how's that look? Does that look normal? Look at the belly button turned inside out, right? That, this guy is filled with serous fluid. And that's called ascites. I want you to know that word. Ascites is a collection of serous fluid. Um, and it's more than serous fluid. Uh, well, remember I said there's a lot of capillaries that surround the peritoneum here. We talked about when a beaver dam happens upstream and the capillary becomes overpressurized, what happens to the, the capillary, the interstitium surrounding that capillary? Does it get filled with fluid? That can happen right here as well. When people get liver disease, cirrhosis of the liver from drinking for hepatitis, the liver scars up so bad, you can't push blood through the liver anymore. And it backs up, it drains into this peritoneal cavity and you get all this fluid. You'll learn some tests. I mean, this one's obvious, but sometimes it's not so obvious. So you'll learn some tests, how to test for this clinically. Um, there's a fluid wave test you'll learn. Uh, when you get to GIGU or CVP, they'll teach you about that. But when you see this, you immediately think there's something wrong with the liver or there's something wrong with the heart. There's a backup of blood. It's backed up all the way into the abdomen here. If you look down at the ankles, they'll probably be swollen up as well. How are we doing on time? Let's just do one more and we'll call it a day. Heidel hernia. Let's talk about that. Um, or esophageal hiatus. Um, so that's the hole. We've already talked about that. That's a hole in the, in the muscular portion of the diaphragm. The diaphragm has a tendinous portion and a muscular portion. It's in the muscular portion. It's located about T10. It's a little bit to the left. There's three other holes. There's one for the aorta called the aortic hiatus, and one for the uh, esophagus is the esophageal hiatus. And one for the inferior vena cava, it's called the cavohiatus. Let's take a look at them on a real specimen here. So this is an eye to ass view. We're looking up. This is the diaphragm. The guy's head would be into the plane of the page here. So we're looking up. All the organs have been removed, all the, the intestines, everything's been removed. And we can see the three holes in the diaphragm. Uh, this is the one uh, for the aorta. This is called the aortic hiatus. This is for the inferior vena cava. That's called the caval hiatus. And this is the one we're worried about. 
Uh, that's called the esophageal hiatus. And you can see that it has a right crust connecting into it right here. You can't see the fibers wrapping around it very well, but it is there. But that's it. Okay, we said it's very important at stopping GERD. It needs to be strong and help pinch the esophagus shut. We already said all this stuff. Here's just a cartoon of somebody with no lower esophageal sphincter, and they just filled up their stomach. And you can see if there's, no, if there's nothing pinching this off, it's really easy for acid to get up there and destroy that tissue, make it precancerous even. Uh, we already said this kind of review. There's the right crust again. Talked about that already. I guess I could probably take these slides out of there. Um, oh, here's always a good board question. What You know how boards love to ask you what goes through holes. Well, what goes through the esophageal hiatus? It's a hole. Well, obviously the esophagus does. But there's some other things. The anterior and posterior vagus nerves pass through this hiatus. right? The vagus, the wandering nerve, it goes all over the body. Uh, the esophageal veins and arteries go through there. That makes sense. And there's some lymphatic vessels that go through there as well. Cares, board, get me out of here. Well, people with hiatal hernia might care about this stuff. So let's talk about that a little more specifically. Strong AKA for hiatal hernia is diaphragmatic hernia. Well, let's see are we in time. What time are we supposed to get out of here? At 4.50? Uh, let's save this. How about? We'll save this for next time. That's enough, because that's probably, that's how I feel. You guys probably feel like that as well. I'm tired, long day. You guys probably had a long day too. More tests tomorrow for you? The whole week is like test week? Every day but Wednesday. All right.